Welcome, everybody. Another known or roundtable. It's May 17th. Um, today on the agenda, we're going to do a quick update on uh, or, or look into, we'll have Jack give us uh, a little bit of what he's dug into on running EVM nodes for EOS. And we'll talk about uh, peer to peer improvements. Uh, but before we do that, I'll hand it over to Brian, who should talk about some update, non update updates about. Uh, Leap 4.0 or 4.1 or whatever it is. I'll give it to you. You know what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So Leap 4.0.1 will be a patch release to Leap fixing a few uh, bugs. We uh, There's two outstanding issues, uh, one of which is confirmed in PR. The other one I'm, I'm working on getting a status update on. Um, but um, yeah, so, so very close to completion on, on that. Uh, no date set for it just yet, um, but it's coming. It's coming around the mountain, um, and uh, and then on the CDT side, um, we're, we're working on 4.0 uh, RC2, um, and then the thing I have the most the most to talk about here is is actually Dune uh, v1.1.1. Um, so it's we have a a patch release to uh, 1.1. Coming out, um, there was a, a conflict um, with OCaml Dune, um, and I have a link which I'll share here in the chat. If anybody's interested in more details on this, they can click in and, and look at this issue to see um, you know what, what that's about. But uh, the patch re release will resolve the name conflicts that we have there on Linux with OCaml Dune. So that's coming soon if you've run into any of those issues. Um, that's it for updates. Um, and then I believe that we had, I can't remember, I actually wasn't paying attention to who spoke up and said they had. Jack, just quick question though, will she be riding six white horses? Oh man, I don't even know that verse. Oh, we should ask your cousin. You have deep they come around about the knowledge. There you go. I was actually on, I was on a mountain again with my son doing a hike, and I was obnoxiously singing that song over and over again. But I only know the chorus pretty much, so I just sang. Oh, that makes it double obnoxious if you don't even know the whole. <laughs> I have to be careful because he will mimic anything I do, so it's going to come back to me tenfold. Anyway, yeah. Anyways, yes. Let's uh, Jack. Uh, let us know what you've learned about EOCVM node operation. Well, more uh, specifically to uh, what we talked about last time, because there was a request to see what would it take for node operators to operate part of that infrastructure. And I think the question initially was like to operate the mining, AKA transaction wrapper side of uh, the EVM infrastructure. So what I learned is actually it's not, uh, before I said it was like one node that would handle reading transactions and you know giving back responding to all the read only kind of calls uh, as well as doing you know handling the each central transaction to actually wrap that metamask rlp transaction into a uh, into like a uh, normal antelope uh, transaction and push that on chain and pay for the cost and so on and so forth so i think the way it's done is the json rpc that the metamask users connect to is actually a proxy already. And it proxies all requests uh, that accept to. So outside sending the raw transaction and getting gas, it routes all these to what they call the EVM RPC. So there's like three parts there. There is the EVM RPC uh, node, there is the EVM node, which is the execution node, and there's the EVM TX wrapper, which is basically what we were calling the miner. To run a miner, just to answer that first question, to run a miner is quite straightforward. It's a stateless node. All it needs to do is to be able to fetch one row, basically the, the one with the gas from the EVM contract, as well as be able to uh, take that RLP transaction and pay for CPU and net and push it to the blockchain. So in terms of running that, that uses almost no resources. All you need to do is have access to an API endpoint that can be even remote and very easy to do. The EVM RPC node is also very light. It's just really a basic JSON RPC server uh, that's written in C++. 
but uh, but it's usually coupled with this EVM node, and that's the one that is a fork of like Silkworm, just like a a client for uh, Ethereum, uh, written in C plus plus, and uh, but modified to basically use uh, stream the ship uh, blocks and be able to form its own database to respond to, you know, get transaction by hash and like all these other call calls that you would make the JSRC request when you're interacting with smart contracts, not just for using MetaMask. So the heavy part here is really just that EVM uh, node, and that's the part that would really need scaling, because the others are, I think anybody can run it very easily. And another core difference I found between that Ether account, which I guess was the, potentially the inspiration for this, since I saw Matthias is the same guy who kind of uh, was working on the EVM as well, and that was his like initial version. And I realized there's a difference where now I think as Kevin mentioned last time, like that the contract is paying for RAM, and since ETH gas or uh, like ETH get gas is making a call to you know just a global or like whatever a config table, it's what it's doing is actually socializing the the RAM costs as far as I can tell. And then from the fees that get incurred by these uh, EVM users, part of that fee goes to paying back the, the miner, so to speak. And another part is to be uh, used to pay for that RAM, the additional cost that that EVM incurs, and then potentially the last whatever remains could be burnt or moved to Rex or, uh, or whatever else. I was just wondering why did the RAM get socialized versus kind of the old version where instead of just pushing the TX and supplying the RLPTX, he also used to supply the C parameter as well as the amount of RAM that the user needs to buy. And then the smart contract would, in, in essence, buy that RAM. So yeah, just just to summarize in the last uh, call in a way. Cool. Yeah, I don't have an answer on, on the reasoning uh, for that, but uh, I'm writing it down to look into it. So thank you for giving that that overview of your, your explorations there. Yeah, and, uh, I can't quite remember uh, the exact details on the RAM. It does uh, simplify, um, you know, the ownership of all that RAM then is just owned by the, the contract, which makes it, you know, simpler to, to, to manage uh, long term, you know, in terms of like, if, if you, you know, at some point want to uh, remove um, that or or, or uh, uh, compact it in some way or, you know, do some some changes along that line to certainly uh, simplify uh, that. Plus, I think it simplifies the, the user um, experience in that, you know, you, you only need to worry about a CPU and that and you don't have to worry about, you know, paying for the, for the RAM. So um, I'm not sure if that's exactly all the reasons why that direction was taken yeah i would think there might be a reason that has to do more specific with the evm firstly than that because um like uh in the old way you you didn't the user didn't have to worry about the, the amount of ram that he needs to purchase right like the rpc node would calculate that figure out how much it would cost to buy that ram pass it as a parameter for him and all the user sees is just the final fee it's paying and then the smart contract would inline by the RAM for that user before it inline executes that RLP transaction. So I'm pretty sure it has to do probably with something in the EVM because here you're not just buying RAM in EOS as I'm or as it was being doing an Ether account. It has to allocate that RAM somehow in that maybe in the EVM or there might be other complications uh, to it. But that, the real reason I'm mentioning it is more not. It's definitely simpler and easier and more convenient for the user, better experience. But doesn't that open an attack vector where somebody can just abuse by, you know, creating things that keep using more RAM since it's only the smart contract that pays for it. And then the cost is socialized to every EVM uh, user who does transaction. Uh, the, you know, the gas cost is supposed to uh, offset that, you know, so there's always a higher uh, cost there than what would be paid for for RAM. Yeah, but the gas cost is paid by everybody. So it means like if I'm one user that is going and making many contracts that are, you know, abusing uh, RAM or using a lot of RAM, the gas price will go up for everybody while I'm paying, you know, the same as everybody else, but I'm not like 
you know, paying for my RAM for the speakers, basically whatever additional RAM I'm making the EVM use, that cost is socialized to everybody because the ease, ease get gas call that's coming to the smart contract is calling a config table with no parameters of that user or anything related to that user. So it's just like, it's just to have some type of mitigation of, I don't know how, maybe in the smart contract and limit how much, you know, I don't know, like a user can push based on his history or it's just like something to, something I thought about that I thought might be important. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, as, yeah, as I've mentioned before, you know, I'm, uh, I haven't been to to date heavily involved in uh, the EVM project, so I'm I'm also coming up to speed. Um, yeah, certainly an interesting topic with regards to how the RAM works, and um, I'll look into that and share with you. Um, if you want to direct message me on on Zoom here, your your Telegram handle, I'll, I'll follow up with you. That's good. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, so the the other topic I had in mind today this is not a um, this is not a proposal. This is sort of information gathering. Um, so something that the Antelope Coalition has expressed interest in is improvements to P two P. There's kind of two pieces of this. There's uh, peer peer discovery. And then there's um, sort of a broader segment of, of improvements. Um, just to kind of scope this conversation, we're not talking about discovery improvements uh, in the questions that I want to kind of throw out to the group and get feedback on here. Um, we're talking about peer-to-peer uh, -peer improvements more broadly. Um, in the event that your feedback is about discovery, uh, don't hesitate to share it but but i will try to um i will try to uh stem any in-depth conversation in that specific area um simply because it's not the focus of what i'm trying to learn the goal of segments like this is really just to get uh community feedback from specifically the node operator um, perspective on um a certain topic in this case peer-to-peer -peer, um and uh nodios uh peering so um before i jump into my questions i wonder if kevin if you want to share any context or or and it's okay if you don't uh any context or thoughts uh to set the stage here um yeah I I don't really have anything prepared. Just the, you know, we're we're looking for uh, feedback you have. For Brian has a number of questions uh, that we can get into. But yeah, just thinking about, you know, thinking and, and other aspects of the PPP network and, and improvements uh, around that. And just for, um, you know, to understand what we're going to do with this feedback, uh, next steps is is developing a proposal for um, specifically what improvements we will make and how, right? What basically refining what the goals of the improvements are. Um, there are some stated in the, the current uh, P2P improvements uh, RFP, um, uh, but we want to sort of uh, refine those and be sure that those are in fact the most important goals to, to, um, to address. And then, of course, you know, another part of the proposal is the solution aspect. How, how <clears throat> excuse me, how are we going to um, approach those goals? And so with that, I've got uh, some kind of open-ended uh, questions. Um, some of them won't necessarily s sound like um, feedback questions, but uh, I'm trying to get like... Um, uh, experiential feedback through these questions. So, um, yeah, first, first, I just want to ask, you know, to the group, uh, anybody who, uh, has experience with this, which I, I would expect would be most or all node operators, um, you know, what struggles or pains that you, uh, currently are experiencing with P 
hearing that aren't aren't related to sinking or discovery. Um, when it first came up, right when we it was on the wish list, it was a wish list, and I I put my hand up and said, "Well, it'd be great if we had automatic discovery, and mm -hmm. um, it would select the most appropriate peer." building some kind of state table that knew what the latency was and you know what was available on the other side you know whether they had the, the full blocks logo etc um the other kind of layer to it was was um you know selecting the most performant peer and sending transactions to the most performant peer and i think it, we got a little bit muddied last time where you know one of them is just syncing and the other one was actually um uh, you know, flying the right direction for transactions, which was, you know, a lot of the stuff that we tried to solve manually um, on Wax when it got really, really busy at some point when we started doing nodes that were only box nodes and nodes that were only transaction nodes to ensure. And, and then those ones were paired to like friendlies. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of other aspect to it. Yeah. yeah, so to, to try and like uh, get subcutaneous here, um, what is the um, what is the underlying problem that you're trying to solve or or uh, or what are you trying to improve, right, with these with these suggestions? Well, you want to ensure that transactions get to the right place with the least amount of latency. And then you also want to ensure that you are syncing. I know you said this is not syncing, but you, have, you want to ensure that you are syncing from the the latest, lowest latent peer that you have available. So it's, it's definitely that it's, it's really that you you have the most up-to-date uh, blocks and state. Is that right? Yeah, because because see this because it's global, right? The block producers flow around the world. There's like ebbs and flows, so it's very difficult to say. Okay, I'm always going to be going there. I'm always going to be going there. So it's so as a user, uh, you uh, when you send a and actually onto the network, it could have a varying experience to you depending on where the 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 signing authority is in the network. Mm -hmm. And those signing authorities are always trying their best manually at this point to ensure that they are accepting those transactions and peering with the, the other nodes that are lowest latency for where the action would then move to somebody else yeah i don't know it's it's all about just ensuring that the block producer that signing that signing those transactions gets that the quickest way possible and okay. us as, as as operators tend to create our own little back framework very very manually at this point in order to ensure that we have the lowest kind of latent links um, and the software itself doesn't automatically select the yep. the, the, the best peer so we kind of okay. manually force it to do that kind of stuff so I will want to ask more specifically about like what those manual workaround solutions look like today. But before we get there, I'm I'm curious to understand when it when is the last time that um, transaction latency uh, created problems for you, and and what problems did it create? Well, it's been a it's been a little bit, hey. Michael and Matthew can probably jump in here. Um, we 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 were having it on um, on the Wax network because people were um, exploiting some contracts, so we're getting an ex uh, you know, exceptional amount of traffic. So it kind of hits the tipping point. That was a few months ago, a few months. We haven't had anything like that of late. But are you looking for like a user story as to what what did the user experience? Yeah, or 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 what, what was happening a lot is the 
because things were so jammed up and kind of just getting wherever, uh, transactions were getting queued and expiring. So they would hit the chain. They would hit an API that says, no problem. And then they'd go into the unapplied queue. They'd get stacked out through a couple of rounds and time out. Now, if you had big expirations, you could, you could survive <laughs> until, you know, the, the, what I call the mempool, but the unapplied queue kind of got flushed back out. And what then happened was the BPs were dealing with crap loads of sloughed off transactions because then they weren't legit because they were expired transactions now. So, I mean, that was kind of how things presented itself, you know, that, that age old issue of, well, the API said it's fine. <laughs> it's because it kind of was, <laughs> yep. but once it got down the chain and, and started <laughs> mashing into the, the C, yep. it really started domino affecting the user experience because they thought it was working and it just disappeared. So then, and then we even had layer twos that freaked out because they weren't you know, handling forks and, and bad data is, is important anyway. So just to make sure, um, I'm understanding. So like the sort of resulting problem is that unapplied transactions queue up and ultimately time out that's happening because latency is high and that's happening because. I want to draw the, the line there. What's well, the queue is high related to how it's kind of, uh, yeah. relaying the, the, this unapplied queue. I mean, it's just like one big pool that yeah. somehow gets smashed. I've also had them rearrange, which I'm not sure where in the line that falls, but I legit got a contract to issue tokens that didn't have the tokens created yet. Because I stacked them in too quick and it reorganized them and said, issue the tokens before you create the tokens and accept it. So anyway, I mean, a reorg of transactions batched together is also kind of a pain point. You don't know which order they're going in. In the same I think, I think what we ended up doing was lubricating the back end manually to make sure everything was manually lowest latent with the best peers with our neighbors in order to mitigate that issue. So that issue ultimately ended up being the way a specific smart contract was used. It gave us an exceptional amount of traffic. So it just reared its head. You know, that wasn't specifically the issue. We just, we solved it by being a little bit more efficient on the back end manually. And you kind of thought told it. What would happen is you'd get a BP unintentionally that would peer in one of these not filtered and kind of optimized peers. And all of a sudden, I mean, if I'm allowing a peer in, they're shoving it into my throat. So, you know, it's, it, I guess from a peer to peer aspect, that's kind of, <laughs> we call it the, uh, an effective virus when they connect, oh, shit's about to start flying both ways. And, and, you yeah. to build this kind of, no, 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 no. Let it, let it be. After subjective billing, after, you know, blacklist, after whatever, you get one person that happens to get one of those nodes sneaks back in, this whole kind of private network would re-ingest all the nasties and kind of circumvent the back side of it. Does that make sense? Mostly. Um, I'm literally typing to Kevin right now. Hey, please jump in if you need to better understand anything. I'm going to go as he helped us drum a Yeah, I was taking notes. What I just wrote down there was, um, so I, I heard, you know, you've got a number of peers and you're getting transactions from those peers. So I think we definitely want to be able to track and report number of transactions uh, per peer, but I'm wondering if we, if you, if you could see a desire for more than that in terms of like being able to, uh, configure and or limit, uh, transactions from individual peers, um, or does it matter? Is it just a matter of being able to track them with the ability, which you already have to actually just 
disconnect up here um, if it starts getting too bad. With what are I mean, I thought the LC one might be there. Really kind of contained to the unapplied Q kind of in in these types of scenarios. So it's it's not really the transactions that are getting relayed in a block. It's really whatever that mesh is of here, I've got some trash to pour into the the 55 gallon bucket and then it kind of just starts moving as this coagulated <laughs> and and whatever order it puts them in and some people were able to figure out how to kind of <laughs> monkey with that that it, so i think that in your mind or at least in the code maybe tracking them and looking at them are two completely aspects one is the number of transactions that would be coming in that are in a block the other is this unapplied key and that's where it really this peer-to-peer -peer mechanism seems to kind of easily jam up because it's that kind of central choke point do you agree kangaroo yeah kangaroo is this no, Jeez, I'm even responding to it now. <laughs> you know, there's, there seems to be a lot of things that rely. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, multiple nodes are on, like hundred thousands of nodes around the world. Everybody trying to sync up as efficiently as possible. Well, that's what we, as the users, that's what we want. For the operators, that's what we want. It's not necessarily certain that the software itself is trying to organize itself into the most optimum way there needs to be some kind of state between the nodes that you connect to you know case in point and i just thought about this now i'm doing a whole lot of testing here at home a lot of the nodes so i'm using just my normal home single ip address a lot of nodes only um uh, by default i think it allows two connections right it is possible for me to have nodes configured with multiple connections or multiple peers and they're trying to get out of my house all coming just with one IP address and they're hitting nodes and there's multiple nodes here during my testing and they're hitting nodes that only allow two IP addresses by default for connection. My nodes don't know this. So they try and connect to the same node that's only allowing two. And let's say I've got like four or five uh, nodes running here on the same network all coming from the same IP address. It's in the same peer. It'll actually stall my node in my house. My my house node does not know that it's because I'm coming from a, an IP address. So my node will actually just sit there and not sync anymore until, you know, and Kevin, I'm not sure what it is that makes it go to the next peer to see if it can use it. You know, ob obviously sometimes it's hitting multiple peers that, you know, because I've configured everything the same and it's getting multiple duplicate addresses trying to connect to me um you know that kind of stuff there's some kind of state of understanding about how it actually appears and um makes it choose where it's allowed you know yeah and then the on who runs that firewall on premise that is a lesson i've learned the hard way and i yeah i've dedicated external peers that only have one connection to them. Uh, if you yeah. try to, yeah, I mean, I got flagged all the time. Of course, it's much better at trying to go to other peers now instead of going in a coma, but sounds like you still. So, Kev, yeah, so yeah, yes. And, and, and Kevin, that's like the mantra of this topic is that there needs to be some kind of um, logic behind where a node is choosing its peer and um trying the next peer that it can connect to or something like that something i'm kind of and it maybe kevin use the uh what is that not the host name the agent name because we not everybody does it not everybody realizes exactly what it is but once i realize what it does you know and kind of tells me who it is or tells me the incorrect address if i put it in wrong but versus the actual network layer ip that is coming from if in the config you denote that it's a different agent name you'd know oh nope you're trying you are the same connection 
but you're actually saying you're a different agent name. In theory, the same node shouldn't be able to respond to different agent names, but can it uniquely enforce the agent name as well? What, what, I mean, that's just a manual. I mean, some people have it all guilty. Well, if you, if you all look a little fine, just caught up in that. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, they're using it. It is coming from the same IP. I mean, from a, from a IP firewall level. Yeah. You've got multiple connections. The problem is, is node OS isn't intelligent enough to say, well, two nodes may be connecting from the same IP, but if on your nodes, you properly identify a unique agent name. Which is what it's using to tell the peer-to-peer. -peer. It tells it that anyway. That's how you know it's who it is. And people have it wrong all the time. But that's why I ask is that if it's unique, wrong or not, that would... And if, we, and if we do use that, then we need to ensure that everybody's well aware of making a, um, a state node-by-node -node agent back. Is that not something you would do normally? No. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. EOS via EOS mainnet. Agent name. <laughs> so we're we're at, um, we're a little past half over. I want to cover a bit more ground. Interesting conversation. Um, you know, I've got some notes. Kevin's got some notes. Uh, but I want to cover some more ground. Um, some, are there any other um, sort of struggles or pains around peer peering um, unrelated to what we've just been discussing. Okay, I wanna talk about uh, resyncing and starting a node um, from a snapshot. So I'm curious, uh, you know, when, let's play, play a quick game, who most recently started a node from a snapshot. Okay. Yeah, on this daily. Today, daily, yeah. Okay. So daily is is the frequency uh, more frequent than daily or just daily? Yeah, sometimes more frequent. Depends how bad my day is. Uh-huh. Yeah. And if what? Rolling out updates. So what is it that, uh, wh why do you need to do it daily? As you said, rolling out updates. Yeah, mainly for uh, I'm running a lot of um, um, big nodes in uh, Tempest S. Mm -hmm. So if the node is uh, uh, rebooted, I will need to um, launch it from a snapshot every time. Uh, and because hmm? I was going to get him out contact, he's not super nerd. Yeah, <laughs> I've got um, yeah, we run over a hundred nodes. There's always something going on. And so it's not necessarily only EOS, you know, it's EOS, Wax, Telos, Beer, whatever. We are always launching nodes. We keep snapshots from all of, all of our chains that we support. And there's always something going on, whether there's more memory, more disk, whatever. Um, you know, wherever, wherever the state database had to get replaced, whether that's because the state database is running inside RAM or it's because there was an upgrade that uh, required, uh, you know, version three to version four, or whatever that needed a, a snapshot. You know, there's there's a lot lot of it. Did you do that contact? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Mike. I was gonna say that CampFS that he keeps mentioning is a, is kind of a hot rod hack. The Node OS is brutal on the state database, just especially on the bigger drives. It's massive, whatever. So span, I think is the first one to kind of do it, but you basically load it up as a template fast drive in RAM and let it beat the snot out of RAM faster and obviously let the abuse up on your drives. The end result is that it doesn't persist on a disk unless you make it do it. So therefore, if you restart your node, you kind of got to build the temp FS back up. And the quickest way to rebuild the state database is with a snapshot. So it's not kind of a normal thing that Node OS does. It's normal for the big boy operators, big boy chain operators, to have to hot rod their machines where that state database is in RAM, which then results in, yeah, anytime you do anything maintenance normal, you kind of got to use a snapshot to relaunch it. Similar, like Matthew probably uses snapshots a lot. When you've used D 
deep mine, you've kind of got to start it at a certain point. And that's that snapshot process that basically says, here's where I want you to be and march forward, go forth and go. Yeah. Yeah. Either and it just hair, and just picks down. up on your, you know, it picks up on your blocks, blog where you left off and carries on. And state history, um, like say it, it, it's that delicate state database and then everything else kind of will fall in line or you don't need any of the old and say, start from here going forward. Yeah. So uh, I want to check on other people's experiences. So is there anyone on the call who is, um, who is re, um, sorry, starting a node from a snapshot significantly less frequently than daily? Okay, so I'm going to assume that at least with our current sample size, that's a pretty common uh, sort of pattern then. Um, yeah. Okay. When you run a lot of nodes, when you run a lot of yeah. chains, yeah. you know, yeah. it's purely a... How often, how often is that starting a node from snapshot uh, sort of relatively seamless versus painful? And it, uh, is it, does it usually go well? Well, Matthew's got a Matthew's. Uh, it's, it's usually goes quite well. Yeah, um, pretty, it's pretty solid. Yeah, unless you just really have it jacked up. Kevin's seen me break it in unique ways. <laughs> For the most part, as long as your log files aren't corrupted, really, really corrupted, yeah, it's pretty solid. But like I say, if it if you've got some bad data, it can get. And, and even in the the block slug tool, uh, what's called leap utility now, that actually fixes up a lot of those end nine little corruption. What is that? Nothing's in those yeah. vapor, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and Matthew, I don't know why he's not talking today. He's got a tricky little uh, um, script that actually you can run, and it asks you which snapshot you want to use or anything. It's pretty cool. So um, one thing to the other, I piggybacks on that. Every, all the big snapshot providers tend to have kind of adapted, probably with Matthew's lead, to have on their snapshot site like a latest dot ZST that people have kind of started building these processes that say sphere run snapshots, ESUSA, nations, whatever. Go and look here and pull the latest snapshot, latest dot ZST, pull it, extract it, restore it. So there has end up being a pseudo standard that we've kind of we, we use zst because it's better than r as matthews made us accept um on these big large files these things are getting to be 10 12 gig snapshot files for some of the larger chains and they don't get will you guys just all use matthew snapshots or do you generate your own snapshots uh, i don't trust those canadians what a <laughs> yeah um yeah so, man, and then we and we all provide them we all provide them as a service to the community so you can actually go to our snapshot portals for later yes. and part of the idea is you need I mean, clarification everybody would have to trust that mason snapshots are are the real accuracy of the chain when you have multiple providers that allows you well look <laughs> not everybody thinks that they're on matthew's chain yeah. We all have given our own version of it, which obviously should. Yeah. Well, one question actually there. Um, do you, Is there any alignment around sort of block heights that you snapshot at? Or is it sort of random per node operator how you do that? I had them at the top of the hour and they have pretty, been never. Pretty random, I'd say, for all of us. I think a lot of us do have some different strategies. I think Nations tends to use like a three-hour window because yeah. they're used things like that. I don't want to speak for them. But yeah. what we do is we hourly, and it, a lot of change for faith throughout the hour, but ultimately two days worth of hourly snapshots. Then like the uh, for a week back, I think it goes to like four a day, and then it slowly starts trimming its way back to I've got something to add from from a creation standpoint. When you run a snapshot, the node stops, right? So it also well, snapshot the state freezes. Correct. Yeah, the the node uh, doesn't crash. It just does not progress anymore. It hangs while the snapshot is taken. Um, for our services, yeah, um, 
when we create the snapshot, we've got separate nodes for that. So that's a that's a bit of a like pain. Like I suppose this is what you got to do, I guess. But I think that we would run uh, you know snapshots on every node if that wasn't the you know it would just generate its own snapshot if it if Another that wasn't there. Another so you can't you can't run it on a production server. That's what I'm saying. You can't take a snapshot of a production server. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And expect it to field requests. Yeah. Another sort of random uh, trivia game here. I'm curious, uh, who thinks they have the oldest snapshot in their possession? Yes. I'd go with nations. Yeah. Or not that they had it for Sweden. Or Sweden. Well, Is anybody running the oldest fault oldest by the font or oldest by the date when it was taken oh uh, no they don't they, you can't trick it like that <laughs> date that it's taken <laughs> well i i actually i mean block height uh interestingly enough so yeah i guess it's true you could theoretically uh replay the whole log apart from genesis well yeah. we, we do that yeah, right. you, uh, that's gonna be good no okay. went from <laughs> right. So oh, now to a certain that's the only way to go back and get really a snapshot or even yeah. old versions of status. Yeah. yeah. Is to actually kind of launch the node at, in its kind of current state and keep it there. Yeah. 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 On the um on the daily we starts from snapshot, uh I, I wanted to clarify something. Um is that daily for any given network or daily simply because you're running for lots of networks. Quantity in our case, I mean, yeah, lots of networks. So what's the, which network do you most frequently restart uh, with a, from a snapshot? Wex. Okay, and what's what's a typical frequency for, for you to restart from a snapshot for Wex? Uh, we got about maybe 30 odd nodes, maybe 20, 30, I don't know, a whole lot. And uh, probably one a day. For whatever reason that might be. I, I'd probably say at least once a week. And I'd say the reason behind mine, self-inflicted, kind of, is because it Wax has this massive state running in memory. And we run I-9s, which are an ECC, and they, they run fine, but about every week or so, one of them just like, now, now, and just falls over and... and it needs to kind of be kickstarted. So, but again, it, it's a hardware kind of level issue. I mean, it runs perfectly fine as long as it ain't running a wax node. But because state is just monopolizing every chip it's got, it finds the bad ones. So, Node OS is very picky about memory and wonkiness. And, and Brian, it's not, we, we're not restarting because of a notious issue here, yeah, right? We're restarting because mainly it's from a maintenance thing for whatever reason. Stuff yeah, was I moved, biases were upgraded, whatever, whatever. I had to turn the machine up and on again. And because Perfect. everything was running in the in TempFS and RAM, it needed a snapshot to, to fire it up again. Yeah, I hope you are. The reason I'm asking these questions is just to fully understand the context around uh, this, so that we I know like the frequency of any problems here or anything. It sounds like overall it, the process works pretty smoothly, um, even though you have to do it pretty frequently. I mean, how long does it typically take for something like Wax or you to um, resync from a snapshot, given that you're taking approximately hourly snapshots? If you have state history enabled, just just go leave, do something else. Yeah. If I get line on my, I think it takes like 15 minutes if a normal snapshot for a number correct. So, without state history running, about 15 minutes to restore or to resync from a well, system that's between zero and a, minutes and an hour old, right? Like, well, it, it also depends on your thinking, depends where you are, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it depends what hardware you got because you can actually under provision your RAM. Um, as well. So instead of, you know, requiring 130 gigs of RAM, you can fire it up with 64 gigs of RAM and you swap and then it'll take like 45 minutes for the node to start to sync again. An interesting tidbit on that, because they're, what, what I find, we snapshot at the top of the hour and then compress that snapshot and, you know, move it out. 
the process to and where my starting point is is at the top of the out. Well, I don't even have my snapshot really kind of available until about 15, 20 minutes into it. And then I download this 10 gig file, extract it, and then kick off the restore or the, the snapshot recovery. That takes 15, maybe 30 minutes. And then if there's kind of anything else either to repair, replay, or resync, which on wax, I mean, you get an hour behind it takes you about 30 minutes, eh, maybe 15 minutes to resync. Icing on the yeah. cake. Your API is responding while you're doing that and serving out stale data. <laughs> yeah. So so it's fair to say then that um, the bigger the snapshot gets, the longer it's going to take over. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's exponential because of so many different steps that it kind of compounds. I mean, some of their chains are 100 megabyte snapshots. Wax is yeah. like 15 gigs. Yep. The, 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 this is a snapshot that's compressed with DSTD, right? Like, uh, if you actually look at like the amount of it's actually using, it's like maybe last I checked was maybe eighty-four gig or something. Oh, yeah, like with the, 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 I'm look. I'm looking at it now. The the database is ninety gigs. Yeah, the actual yes. database is ninety gigs. Yeah. Is 90 gigs. The snapshot is probably yeah. maybe twenty gigs, and then I think we all the our ball of zip them up. And it becomes about 10 yeah. 15 gigs. But again, I mean, that's <laughs> when it's 10 gigs a pop and, and it just, it, it, it can take you a solid hour, best case scenario. And I just, that... here's an interesting thing. It took me 14 hours to recover a wax state history node last week. I hit yeah. Kevin up and was like, holy hell, what is this? And yeah. ultimately when it starts having to repair any of those like state history log files, get a day almost i mean it floored and it was a nine nine ripping the shit out of it it just took but i know that if if you want to start a state history node that has no pre-existing state history or blocks from a snapshot in other words starts a light node that thing can toil for hours and hours and hours while it rebuilds itself uh and that's not even going to go back to the beginning right it's going to just start from you know whatever the snapshot was do you know if that's because of the gigantic memory usage and you don't have the RAM on that machine so it's swapping or is it just actual CPU? Like have you done that with uh, a machine that's got 256 gigs of RAM, for example? No, no I haven't. Oh, that's the other thing. I have to always keep the state history a little bit more RAM. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, but I think that I have Kevin. With my outs for your We're lucky to get the teeth back there with the 4.0 because that. That's fixed there. I think it's in 4.0 uh, where we've got the memory fixed mm -hmm. for. Uh, for yeah, we got, like, uh, like I said, we will get PTSD about touching our state histories with anything other than 3.1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're trying to. There, there, there are some, there are some, some uh, dragons there in 4.0 for sure. Uh, 4.0 bot hopefully will we'll handle it. Okay, I'll do it. Take you away for now. There's a lot of disk I know. That's really like I remember correctly. That was the bottleneck. It's like this guy always needs to write this initial state history files, and it's just like killing you. You know, like I usually run it on like RAID zero NVMM NVMe arrays or something, and you're still like you you you're maxing that out. So it's that, they, I see that's still the bottleneck, and and that's where Ross gets the temp FS. I mean, memory is faster than RAID zero NVMe, kind of, <laughs> but it's still. I mean, well, yeah, the speed well, we, of light we, we has a limit. <laughs> We were throwing SSDs away, even just on the EOS network, just running that state database on the SSD. I, do. I just that breaks that up. burn out and in three years and you throw them in the bed. Yeah. They three years. I mean, I run consumer growth right. uh, EVOs, but for the for the record, I just yeah. smashed the shit out of my NVMEs for the state DB about do you know, an NVMe. I'm, do you know I can I check the smart wear out um, on the drives? And since I do the temp and it's just, the I.O. goes up and the actual disk I.O. goes down and the 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 wear out just lost. Like it's not even touching the disk. But the sacrifice he makes is that anytime he's snapshot or from a snapshot every single. I don't know. I'm fine. Like right now, even when I have to start a note at other snapshot, I feel weird. Like what's going on? <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> I'm so used to it now. So. 
It sounds like there's, okay, th so there's two very different cases, right? There's restarting a state history node, and there's restarting a non-state history node. That second mm -hmm. case is the more common case, and it's much faster. Um, let's focus on that one first. Um, in that case, you said maybe 15 minutes um, or, or perhaps a little longer for a wax node. Um, is that fast enough? And if not, like what ca what problems is it causing that it takes 15 minutes? You know, Twofold. One, you're getting behind those 15 minutes. Two, when it does come online and tries to start scrambling to catch up, you're feeding stale data. If you haven't had some uh, extra help checks or change the API borders, uh, yeah, that's the other farther you can get behind. Yeah. I can tell on all my monitoring systems when everybody does that because all of a sudden I see something from 10 minutes ago. Where the hell did that come from? Yep, somebody's API. And we're just, it's lesser of two evils. I'm like, ah, well, maybe you'll error handle. I just throw it out there and say, here you go. Hopefully he didn't need state data for 10 minutes. So, what exactly should you do or the software do automatically for you or whatever to avoid? feeding state, uh, stale data while you are. One of the things we talked about, I think it was a feature request, was that ready and it returning like, hey, it was like a ready endpoint or something of that nature to where you could intelligently say, if it's returning a 200, assume it's, it's ready to accept connection. That said, well, what drives that threshold? In my opinion, and Kevin, I think narrowed it down, the node reacts differently when it knows it's behind lib versus trying to catch up to the head block. It sinks in bulk. It does things different. My opinion. It's in a, there's two different states. It's like that's a that's a live thing. Whatever triggers the peer to peer and that logic that they already, how it knows, in my opinion, might be the best option to say, look, I'm in sync with the live. I may still be catching up the head, but don't give an okay status or respond until you're at live. And what do you I suggest? What do you currently do? Uh, do you have any kind of work work around currently to avoid that issue? Some people have hacked their proxy to do a more intelligent health check. Stan provided some HA proxies to say get block, and if it isn't current, don't use it as a routing request. I will just go in and change the API port whenever I'm relaunching it. Therefore, it thinks it's down. Then when it's in sync, I'll change the API, API port back, and then my proxy server starts. Dealing to it. And do you do that manually or is there an automated? I'm doing it manually because I don't have my proxies intelligent enough to either check the valid data or yeah. there's nothing. It just says, is it there? It ping, let her rip. And it's well, keep in mind that out. So, keep in mind, this is still part of a manual process, right? Because the reason yeah. he's changing the port is because he manually decided to restore from snapshot. There's something that that potentially failed. I would venture to say it's one of the reasons you can't really automate some of your recovery processes. If it were to crash, relaunch it and pull a snapshot and fix yourself. Well, you can't. I want my node automatically rolling back to an hour old snapshot and respond. If you automate it, well, you can still automate it, right? Because you can just add to your automation script, like, you know, USW close this port on this machine. And then reopen it after you know it, it reaches a block. Like you still have that option. It just obviously lots well, of manual options. It's just more just that nothing or automate it. So we used to have this problem all the time. Nodes wouldn't resync because all the peers would connect and whatever. So we wrote console services and console template that rewrites nginx automatically based on whether the node is in sync or not. So nginx will send peer to peer traffic or API traffic only if the node is in sync. They've modified their proxy. Yeah. Because otherwise, I was dealing with the same thing with Michael. It's like, manually put it in, out. Oh, I was like, this is ridiculous. So, so, right? well, so we pulled the whole thing for that. Going back just a little bit, talk about um, you know, a lot of disk I.O. Um, would, would it be helpful to write compressed uh, files or face ship or... Uh, or are you putting it on a compressed drive, and so that's not really useful? Uh, should we just go on a compressed drive first? 
Sorry. I'm sorry. The ships already compressed. It's, it's yeah. Easy. yeah. I mean, the, the files themselves, other than being massive and big, I mean, they're... <laughs> Blockers <laughs> it's, it's... Block gives you about 30%. Um, I use LZ4 on using ZFS, okay. um, and that gives you about 30%. Uh, state history is less. So you say, Matthew, it's already compressed. Then it's changed. Yeah, I think that's I, I, I thought state history was already compressed. Right. Uh, I think it is. Yeah, in, in, in the in recent, fairly recent change. Uh, well, compared to what day. Um, other question I had was, um, I think Brian was going to get get to this, but we're running out of time, so I just want to jump ahead. Um, are there use cases for replaying from Genesis? And if so, what are they? Maybe if you had like a full node and you want to start, you know, taking the deep mind logs, you might not want to, you know, use your network and resync with peers and just replay that and have, you know, deep mind output the logs to a mind reader. I've used the logs, block logs from different networks to rebuild state history logs for nodes. More people will provide couple terabyte block log file not the 15 terabyte state history so that required replay from genesis replay but not it, resync not for resync. you said not play right yeah he said re replay. yeah replay i'm sorry yeah replay for what um, some yeah, people I, also do it to get to a certain spot in time. They'll they'll trim yeah. the block log and then replay it to get the node at that particular spot in time. Right. Okay. Well, it was coming up because you know we're talking about um, you know things to optimize uh, thinking, right? And and we were talking about well, what are we really talking about? Are we I don't think we're talking about we need to optimize syncing from Genesis, right? What we're wanting to optimize, it sounds like, is syncing from a, a start of a snapshot, right, up to up to head. Like that, there are two different issues. I mean, one's less prevalent, but a lot of people don't want to start from a snapshot. They will, I mean, like exchanges or, you know, validation-heavy awards. They want to have the whole chain from block one. History provided. Correct. So... Right. Well, but well, that's well, different than 95% of the nodes are, aren't even <laughs> a month old data and they're trending their logs anyway. So yes, by far the large majority is. Well, would those users actually sync from Genesis or would they download a block log and replay it? The natural tendency is, and the way instructions intend to be, is get the Genesis block, pull some peers and sync it all in. But as we have all painfully learned, <laughs> You don't do that. Number one, good luck finding the peers. Number two, it's going to take months and months and months and months and months. So I send them to Ross's site to go to Village's block log of a couple terabytes and then get that jump started. But right. the example you gave an exchange, like when you asked like, who might require that, I don't think it falls into that. An exchange is never going to just take a block log with somebody else. Right. They intend to want to say, nope, number one, forward. And... Like whether it's site on Genesis or even like a snapshot, like they might. But I think the real use case for replay is if you didn't have a history solution, but you have all the data and you want to replay it to extract that history solution. Even for snap or you're saying replay to a certain part, normally you'll just trim and then you can just continue normal syncing to that point. Like you don't really need a replay as much because there's nothing to replay after you trimmed. So I think I heard you just said that an exchange wouldn't trust a block log, but they would trust thinking from peer, like it trying thinking right. peer level of block log. I mean, it's the same thing, right? Because they're it was, on the when you replay the with the peer, when you replay a lock, block log, that's legit, right? You can't. Yeah, in theory, it's still legit. validating every block and transaction, but from what I've found in the conversations, and I don't have too many of them, but they any external trust of source other than peer-to-peer block-by-block validation of the transactions is nope we don't do that we start at the beginning of the chain we sync the whole chain we we know we have personally validated and there's no way is how they tend to say it now yes you're right it's the same thing 
here's the log. It's going to yeah. validate it. I don't even know. Does it validate? I guess there is. But but it would be because when you when you're syncing with a peer, you basically just copying from their block log, right? And it validates. But you're validating every transaction if you're doing a full validation, right? So then replay, like the, the, it's the yeah. same thing, but it's really it comes down to conceptually, like people, the feelings from you know coming from different crypto and stuff. They're just like, no, no, we're gonna start from Genesis. We're not gonna start right. trust someone else. Under the hood, it's all really the same. You're just right. sending that extra network bandwidth. And you're, but you're still doing the validation and making sure it builds on top of each other. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I guess they're just used to, like, that's the way you do it in Ethereum and other chains, right? Trust no one. <laughs> yeah, when you, you sync, although you're, you're trusting who you're syncing from. So, I mean, you're still trusting, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, okay. Thank you. I, I know we're trusting know, the, multiple sources at the same time. Or, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's. That's the thing is that with like Bitcoin, when you when you resync the or when you sync the node, you're not just pulling from one from one other node from one peer. You're pulling blocks from you know a thousand other peers over the over the three day period or whatever that you're downloading it. So you know it's that redundancy that's built in that kind of has solidified itself in the ethos there, especially among um, exchanges and that sort of thing. Uh, especially those chains are very light compared to yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's getting less and less full block slugs nodes for EOS in particular, for Wax in particular, because you need like terabytes, right? <laughs> so I uh, I appreciate the discussion. Uh, definitely a lot of interesting stuff covered. Um, I've got a lot of notes and, and new information I didn't have previously. Um, next steps, as I mentioned before, is... Um, uh, but developing, you know, first draft proposal for peer-to-peer -peer improvements. Um, as we go through that process, it's very likely that we will encounter new unanswered questions that we didn't think to ask. Um, so, you know, we might we might address some of those uh, next call um, or in a following call. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everybody uh, participating and and maybe. Just a very small request since we're talking about snapshot. If we can have the snapshot from Node EOS output be similar like US Nations one, like in the naming, where instead of just having the you know the hash of the block, where yes, you can extract the block number from it, instead you can have the hash and the block number already there. It's just much easier when when matching. I wonder if that was gonna come up. Yeah, the fact that it always generates the block hash. But I mean, at least you have something. <laughs> That that's how I name ours. Ours gets name is by looking at the hash and then it names it. <laughs> Great. So yes, I mean even just simply the block number itself, even if it's not a date time, I live off date time, but the block yeah. number that's not what we're looking for more is a hype there. Where the hell is it? Yeah. And I promise you, getting it off by five minutes pisses you off. <laughs> Damn. Missing gaps in your state history, then you got to go do it all over again because you were five minutes after when it actually was needed. Oh, all right. Well, thanks again, everybody. I'll hand it back to Daniel. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Have an awesome day. See you all next week. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, guys.